Thanks, Don, and, and I'd also like to uh, welcome everyone here to uh, this event. This is a, an annual, and each year it gets to be better and better and, and more exciting, and, and I think it shows our devotion as a university to working uh, with the, uh, in the, in the Great Lakes in, in, in order to uh, really develop all the science that's, that's necessary any remediation that needs to take place. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce Congress, Congressman Molinar, but before I do that, I would also like to uh, recognize two other people who are here with us. Uh, one is uh, Bruce McAtee from Senator Peter's office, and Bruce is sitting over there, and, and also um, State Representative Roger Hauck, who uh, represents us down in Lansing and, and run over back there. Okay, uh, now, uh, you know, I've been here for four and a half years, and I think the first time I met Congressman Molinar was before he was in Congress, and I think we went to a Loons game uh, together, and he got to throw out the first pitch, and they were smart enough not to put me on the mound. Uh, Congressman Molinar has been in Congress since 2014, and he represents the residents of Michigan's 4th Congressional District. Uh, Molinar brings years of leadership expertise and experience in both the private and the public sectors, uh, and he brings this to Congress where it's, it's really, I, I think it's really needed uh, in both the private and the public expertise. He has worked as a chemist and as a business development director and as an administrator of Midland Academy of Advanced and Creative Studies. As a public servant, uh, John has been elected to the Midland City Council, the Michigan House of Representatives, the Michigan, and the Michigan Senate. Congressman Molinar was born and raised in Midland, where he now lives with his family. Congressman Molinar is currently a member of the House Appropriations Committee, which is probably the most important committee in Congress, or at least in the, in the House, which allocates funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, a program he has long supported. He's also worked uh, in, with others in efforts to protect, protect the Great Lakes from the threat of Asian carp, and in 2016 he worked with uh, CMU alum Dan Kildee on the molinar Kildee Amendment to pass federal funding to rebuild the water infrastructure in Flint. Finally, He's proud to represent CMU in Congress, and in 2016, he wore a Central Michigan University uniform in the Congressional Baseball game. It was good luck. He laced a single into center field in that game. So from pitching to hitting, he's, got the, he's a complete congressman. And with that, let me welcome Congressman Molinar. It is uh, a privilege to be here. And, um, and I'm just grateful for the opportunity and, and honored to serve as your congressman for this district. And, um, you know, this is becoming a great annual event, and uh, CMU is certainly a great leader in research involving the Great Lakes. And um, everyone from President Ross uh, to the leadership team on the faculty, staff, and uh, students um, really are contributing to that legacy. Um, I wanted to discuss this morning some of the legislative efforts in Congress affecting the lakes, and, and as was mentioned uh, by the provost, it is truly a bipartisan effort on behalf of uh, the Michigan delegation. And there's a number of efforts underway to protect the Great Lakes, and I also want to just give you a kind of a glimpse of what the policymaking process is when it comes to protecting the Great Lakes. Um, earlier this year, many of you no, there was concerned. Um, there was a proposal to eliminate the funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And many of you, I'm sure, and others across the state and country, you know, wrote their representatives, uh, their senators, and raised concerns about what this would mean for our Great Lakes and their future. And, and uh, each chamber in Congress has an appropriations committee uh, both the House and the Senate, and this year we passed 12 bills in the House to, to fund the government. Um, every fiscal year starts October 1st and runs through September 30th of the following year, and 
The federal budget's around $4 trillion. Uh, as you may know, we have uh, $20 trillion in debt. So that's a significant concern. And so, as you can imagine, Congress is focused on finding ways to trim that spending and to eliminate wasteful spending. But turning back to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, that's something that all of us would agree is a huge priority. And um, it's been funded at $300 million for the past several years. And uh, Congress has really been the champion for funding the Great Lakes. And as I mentioned earlier, it's been a bipartisan effort. Uh, administrations from both parties have actually proposed uh, reducing funding for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. In fact, when I was on the Budget Committee two years ago, one of our first hearings was with President Obama's Budget Director, Sean Donovan, and one of the first questions I asked him is why the administration had proposed a $50 million cut to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. That would have been a 16% cut, which would have hurt the possibility of funding research grants like the ones that fund research here at CMU's Institute for Great Lakes Research and the CMU Biological Station on Beaver Island. Of course, that cut never happened, and that's because members from Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, New York, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and of course, Michigan, all worked hard to advocate for the Great Lakes with their colleagues from other states. So you might ask, where do things stand this year? This year, as I mentioned, um, the House passed all 12 appropriations bills, uh, with each one funding a specific area. For instance, the, there's the VA, there's the Defense Department, one for the State Department, and so on. But full funding at $300 million is included in the appropriations bill for the Interior Department, Environment, and Related Agencies for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it will become law because it has to pass both the House and the Senate. But I am optimistic because there, there is bipartisan support and bicameral support for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in Congress. And so I believe, and I'm very optimistic, that research like Dr. Uzarski's will continue for years to come. And you should be very proud of that. His study of 60,000 acres of coastal wetlands on the Great Lakes helps us gain a better understanding of the health and vitality of the lakes, as well as the threats they face. The Institute is on the front lines of understanding the ways the lakes, tributaries, and wetlands come together as one ecosystem. And its research is a great asset to scientists and the general public. I've also been working in Congress on other issues involving the Great Lakes. For instance, there's bipartisan opposition to Canada's plan to build a nuclear waste disposal site on the shores of Lake Huron. And we're working very hard with the State Department and others to address this issue with our Canadian counterparts. There's also the issue of algae blooms in Lake Erie. And I was pleased to see that earlier this week, stakeholders from Michigan government, business, and conservation groups, some of uh, them we have here today, uh, have come together to form my clear to address the issue. And our own uh, agriculture director, Jamie Clover Adams, is very engaged on behalf of the state of Michigan. There's other kinds of partnerships to allow parties to find common ground and real solutions that will improve the environment and allow for sustainable growth and development. Of course, we're also very concerned about invasive species and the existence of Asian carp in Lake Erie. And I know your team has been working on that, and I appreciate the updates they have provided me and my staff, as well as the entire Michigan delegation. And of course, we're worried about Asian carp coming through the waterways of south of Chicago. And that's why this summer, we pressured the administration into releasing the Brandon Road Lock and Dam Report. On Ju July 28th, one day after we passed the appropriations bill, uh, putting language in there that required them to release the report. They actually did release the report. And um, stopping Asian carp is a critical step in protecting the thousands of Michigan jobs provided by tourism, boating and fishing, in, and preserving the Great Lakes for future generations. This report has been out since early August, and there's a public comment period through November 16th that allows every American to share their thoughts with the Army Corps of Engineers uh, on the best way to prevent Asian carp. 
from entering the Great Lakes, and I want you to feel free and encourage you to participate in that by going on the Army Corps website and, and offering your feedback. Of course, not every American is going to have an opinion on the Great Lakes, and that brings me to one final thought I'd like to share with you, which makes this a continual challenge and also important that we continue to advocate in a bipartisan way on this. One of the biggest issues we face in making sure we continue to educate the American public about the Great Lakes and how important they are to our country. The Great Lakes are a critical resource and an essential part of our outdoor heritage. They're enjoyed by millions of Americans from across the country in our unique ecosystem that provide one-fifth of the world's fresh water. They're also a major trade route, and they form an international border. And there is a federal role for protecting the Great Lakes, and by working with public and private organizations like CMU, Ducks Unlimited, the GLRI does vital work to protect the lakes and streams, rivers and wetlands that flow into them. Of course, in Michigan, we know this information. That's familiar to us. But here's the challenge. I mentioned earlier uh, President Obama, the budget director we spoke with in committee. His budget director was from New York City. President Trump's budget director is from South Carolina. They aren't as intimately familiar with the Great Lakes as we are in Michigan. They're not first and foremost on their minds. In fact, earlier this year in an open hearing, I had the opportunity to question President Trump's budget director, and I mentioned all the points about the Great Lakes I just made to give him some information on why I believe, there, I believe there's an obvious role for the federal government protecting the Great Lakes rather than simply looking at it as a, a regional effort or something that's important to the people of Michigan. He responded by saying there is an international component that may make the GLRI more federal than I had thought it was before we chatted. So just right there, you have a person from South Carolina who's thinking about the overall uh, infrastructure of our country, but doesn't have the in-depth knowledge of the Great Lakes that all of you do simply by understanding the importance of that being here in Michigan. We probably all know someone who didn't grow up around the Great Lakes who saw them for the first time and was amazed at the freshwater seas that we're blessed to have in our state. And we should do everything we can to introduce people from all over the world to these lakes that we treasure and help them understand the threats that they face. We should do it with facts and frank discussion, without hyperbole, without hate. You know, sometimes these political discussions become very divisive, but the Great Lakes can be a great unifier. It's a God-given gift that we have that's worthy of our best stewardship. And I hope all of you continue here at Central Michigan University to do the great work you're doing. And I'm going to continue to be a strong advocate for the Institute, for CMU, and our Great Lakes that are truly pure Michigan. And I want to thank you today. I know Eva Verana is here. That's going to be part, she's part of our staff, and she's going to be part of a panel a little bit later. Uh, very knowledgeable. And, um, and I know also we're going to hear from Senator Bohr a little bit later, but I'm honored to be here with you, and I congratulate you on the excellent work you're doing. And it, believe me, it, it makes me proud to advocate for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, knowing the work that you're doing here at Central Michigan University. So thank you very much. Now, you do have some note cards in front of you. Um, some people have already submitted questions. I encourage you to do so. We have four individuals walking around the room. You can see them over here with the CMU shirts. They will bring those up, and uh, please get those questions in. Congressman, I do have a few questions that came in. Uh, one, do any of your colleagues in Congress oppose funding GLRI? So we could, so, you know, I think you touched on that. We could see that folks from outside the basin. Is there anyone else essentially looking at that 300 million saying, you know, maybe some of that could, could come to our states instead? Well, yeah, I think that's the challenge when you're dealing in the federal government. There are always competing priorities and, and different regional uh, areas that people are familiar with. That's been... Um, you know, it, that's why there's that need for continual education 
uh, not only within the Great Lakes states, but across the country about the importance of the federal role, uh, the uniqueness, the freshwater, 20% of the world's freshwater, and to continue to help others and other states understand that. Because in, when it comes to appropriations, we're always um, competing priorities for that funding. And uh, so in order to make it continue to be high on the priority list, we need to keep advocating. Okay, thank you. Um, more coming in here. <clears throat> Why do you think it's so hard to get the government to do something about impending threats of Asian carp and other invasive species entering the Great Lakes? You know, I, I think, um, again, most people, until the video of the Asian carp came out, you know, where they're flying out of the water and hitting people, I don't think anybody truly, well, maybe some of you did, but no one really understood what that looked like. And so, um, again, there's a visible uh, threat. Some of the other threats aren't quite as visible. Uh, and, and quite frankly, there are competing interests. So one of the challenges has been, you know, in the Chicago area, you know, the Great Lakes are used for industrial purposes, a lot of the shipping. Um, and so when you compete with how do you keep shipping lanes open but at the same time prevent um, invasive species, that's kind of the, the balance. And so one of the reasons we wanted the Army Corps report to come out was we wanted to say, okay, what are some of the ideas? What can be implemented in the short term? And there are various things from electric barriers to enhanced fishing, you know, you name it, there's all sorts of different short-term um, ideas that help slow the, um, you know, slow down the threat. But at the end of the day, until you have more or less a separation, you can't be 100% sure. But of course, that costs a lot of money and it also threatens uh, some of the um, shipping lanes. And so, trying to strike that right balance between, you know, the commercial aspects versus the uh, conservation aspects is, is part of the challenge. And I think that's one of the reasons the Army Corps was kind of slow to release that report. And that's why we haven't had as much action on it as I'd like to see. Okay, thank you. Um, what are the concerns regarding future funding for GLRI? I know I can speak for myself the first year it was 450 million, it was cut to 300 million. We're now um, seven years into this, eight, going on eight years into this. I know from a research perspective, our costs are going up, yet that funding is, is staying constant. Yeah, I think, I mean, it, the initial proposal was to eliminate it. And so we were able, <laughs> we were able to push back on that. Um, I think the more people understand uh, the benefit of the Great Lakes funding, uh, the better. And so that's up to, for me, my colleagues in the Michigan delegation, as well as other states, to keep making that case uh, with our colleagues from other states and other regions who have their uh, priorities that they're familiar with and, and to why this. And when I can report on research that's being done and how it you know, benefits not only the Great Lakes, but, you know, has broader applications because a lot of the research you're done doing here has broader applications in the Great Lakes. And so what we learn here protecting the Great Lakes is going to help in other uh, regions of the country as well. And so the more we can make the case for that basic research that's done that has a multiplier effect, I think the better. Okay, thank you. We're, we're seeing consistent themes here a little bit. Uh, how do you think current political environment and push for co cooperation will impact the quality of the Great Lakes? Well, I, you know, I, one of the things that's been really um, consistent, I think, is the Michigan delegation, the House and the Senate, has been working together on this. There is no, no division at all. I mean, there are issues that divide, but I would say the Great Lakes are, are, are a real unifier. And, um, you know, there's always a question, you know, we'd like to do more and how do we do that? Um, but I think there is unity and, and it's not a divisive issue at all. And so very bipartisan. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Uh, why do you think it has taken so long for the Corps of Engineers to release the Brandon Road project uh, report? I, I think it's, you know, them trying to figure out a way to balance these interests. You know, I think in, in the Army Corps has different areas. Um, you know, you've got the Chicago area, you've got the Detroit area, you've got different interests that are um, at stake. Um, so I, I do think the complexity of that has prevented uh, action. Now, to me, I don't understand why that would prevent a report from being issued because all the report does is just spells out different options, and that should be a very public deliberation where we can say, hey, I like this approach or I don't like this approach. This is a good short-term fix, but we need a longer-term fix. And to have that debate, you need things public. And uh, so that was a huge disappointment when they wouldn't release it. And when they did, uh, I think that was a step forward. And now uh, I think the public comment period goes through mid-November. And, uh, and then we can further have further deliberations uh, moving forward. But, you know, this, you know, it's time for action. And, um, you know, a lot of the short-term interim strategies have been helpful. But still, we're finding um, Asian carp, you know, within nine miles of the Great Lakes, and, and that's just too close. Agreed. Um, please explain the process for funding GLRI. What has to happen? What steps uh, does that have to go through? So every year, um, there's an appropriations process, and there are 12 different appropriations bills that fund different parts of the federal government. And the GLRI is part of the, um, you know, one of those appropriations that, um, you know, has an overall level that is set where, you know, we're given guidelines for each of those 12 bills. Here's kind of a baseline number to work from. And then you have to set priorities within that. And so my job on the committee is to advocate uh, Ken Calvert uh, is the chairman, uh, he's from California. My job is to advocate with the subcommittee chairman to say, you know, this is an important part, even though I'm not on that subcommittee at this point, um, I want to encourage him to include the full funding. And we were able to have that discussion. He's been very supportive. And, uh, and then he advocates for his, um, his uh, appropriation on the House floor. And this has been where it's helpful to have Dan Kildee and, and others in the Michigan delegation where, you know, we in a bipartisan way can advocate for the funding as it goes through the subcommittee, then the full committee, and then the full House floor. Now, when it gets to the Senate, um, you know, the Senate is working on their process, and so that's where Gary Peters and Debbie Stabenow are important advocating for this. And, We've done Michigan delegation letters where we all sign on and, you know, we've written them to the, you know, the administration. We sometimes write them to different, um, you know, committee chairs. But that process uh, is, is ongoing just to help bring the issue to light and to get the communication to the right people because ultimately those subcommittee chairs are making decisions on you know, they've got a, a, a one number and then they have to fit all those priorities within that number. And so they're making choices as to what's more important as others. And so it's that continual education process and advocacy. Okay, thank you. Um, do you think uh, your colleagues in Congress understand the importance of the Great Lakes to the environment and economy of the United States? So uh, I, I, think, I think in the past it was often thought of that you either get a healthy environment or a healthy economy, and, and that you can't have both. And I, th I, think, I think we're seeing a difference there. I think that, that it, that's not the case. Yeah, I think, I think that's definitely the case where, um, you know, again, in, in, in our region of the country, I think we understand that. You know, we understand the importance of tourism, the fishing, uh, recreation, the shipping, I mean, all the Great Lakes have so many um, functions. And, um, but if you get outside of our region, that w that's why I mentioned our, my conversation with the budget director who's from South Carolina. 
in his mind, before we went through this process, it was kind of like, okay, that's an important regional body of water. And he didn't necessarily think, and I think that's common for people in other parts of the country where they, it's just not first and foremost on their mind. I mean, they, when you look at a map, it's pretty hard to ignore the Great Lakes. I mean, it's, it's huge. Um, but if it's not in your daily, you know, if you aren't thinking about that, you know, you're thinking about other priorities in your state, in your region, and uh, wanting to see those dollars steered that way. And so it's a continual process. I think we made a lot of headway with this administration uh, in this year, and we'll just keep working at it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for doing that. Um, why do you suppose the Obama administration and the Trump administration cut funding or proposed cut funding for GLRI in their budget proposals? You know, I think some of it is, uh, you know, anytime you have an ongoing program, you have to have results that you can point to that say, okay, this is why it needs to be funded going forward. And I think when it has been in place for a while, you start to wonder if there's diminishing returns from the research or the investment. And so I think there always needs to be that continual case being made as to, you know, the new research projects, what the benefit of that is. Um, I think um, that's where, you know, the work you're doing here in helping connect with lawmakers, with uh, policymakers to understand the relevance of it. Because it, you know, $300 million, that's, that's a lot of, I mean, it, it's a lot of money, and uh, when you're short in budget area, in other budget areas, you see that $300 million and say, well, there are other priorities, and we've been doing this for a while. Shouldn't we look at this? You know, and, and so I think that continual engagement of why this is relevant to everyone's future um, makes the case better. Agreed. <clears throat> Uh, what can we do to convince Congress and the administration to increase funding for GLRI? Is it, you know, it was it was essentially zeroed out or proposed to be. Uh, what can we do in this room? You know, um, I think, you know, continued ad advocacy. Um, I think making the case as to, you know, what what the future research might look like and how all of us benefit from that. I think Again, making that case because one of the things in government you'll find is is every part, every line item in a budget has a constituency and people who are advocating for it, and you're always sort of comparing the merits of all of those. So, in order to really have a bump up, um, you have to make the case as to why that needs to occur. I, you know, one of the things that was very uh, powerful, I thought, is um, when we were debating this in the full Appropriations Committee, uh, Marcy Kaptur, who's a representative from Ohio, uh, had some pictures and some just, you know, things that members could look at that actually kind of made the case right on the spot. And um, so I think to whatever extent you can arm me or other members of the Michigan delegation with easily understood facts or benefits from the research that helps me say, here's why this research is important to my colleagues. Uh, that strengthens it and then makes the case better. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this will probably have to be our last question because I know you do have to uh, another speaking engagement soon. Uh, so uh, what has Congress done in the past or plan to do in the future to ensure that vulnerable communities such as uh, minorities and the poor are not disproportionately impacted by pollution or other environmental issues? Well, uh, the main, th I mean, a few things. One is you want to make sure laws are applied equally and that there aren't different tiers of enforcement or uh, participation. The other thing is I think a growing economy and giving communities the opportunity to thrive economically ultimately helps the environment as well. If you look at the places where the environment is cared for the best, it's the places where 
people have resources that they can put towards it, whether it's government resources, private resources. Um, so I think the combination of you know, equal application of the law and the, the rules, but also providing opportunity for prosperity so that we can continue to, to work at some of these common goals. It, it, uh, it doesn't help anyone to have a downward economic spiral because ultimately that hurts the environment as much as anything. So those would be a couple thoughts. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Thank you. Congressman. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming.